just wanted to share something that someone shared with me earlier today. It was an Instagram post that was um, shared by Yakin Institute, and it's uh, a powerful, um, a powerful bit of information from their research, um, which is interesting because I think if you ask sort of the average Muslim, you know, based on like um, appearances and marketing and um, you know, just overall where things are, people would probably say Yakin Institute is one of our best, you know, in terms of what the Muslim community has to offer in terms of, you know, professionalism, you know, they have really nice infographics, they're colorful, you know, they have a lot of Muslims on their, um, on their, you know, board or, you know, as part of their organization. Um, and so this was fascinating. Um, it's, it, they did a whole infographic, it's called Raising Doubt. And the statistic is that um, one in four is the number of Americans who are raised as Muslims who report no longer identifying with Islam in adulthood, predominantly moving towards atheism or no religion. Um, one in four, which is, you know, a pretty huge number. I, I would actually, I would have thought that it would have been more than that. And, you know, you never know how, how research statistics are. But I was fascinated to see, like, what the reaction would be. Um, so, of course, I read comments and I, like, kind of dug a little deeper to see, okay, what is this based on? And it's based actually on a, a research paper um, by Dr. Osman Umarji called Can Childhood Experiences Predict Religiosity? and doubt in adults. It's an empirical analysis of Muslims, and apparently they did a lot of surveys and, and so forth. Um, but what was interesting is, you know, a lot of the comments um, and like, you know, I think people were surprised. Um, they wanted to know what the sources were, but there was one comment that stuck out to me, um, which I thought I would share, which is there are entire movements of ex-evangelicals and ex-Mormons most of us were raised to be very devout. For a lot of us, our doubts arose because the things that we were being taught conflicted with our values as human beings. Some of us continued in our faith, but in a newer, truer way. Others left our faith entirely. This definitely isn't an issue that is unique to Islam, which is, you know, completely true. Um, and I thought I would share, you know, like they, so this whole infographic goes on to explain, you know, okay, what is doubt? They can be hard doubts, soft doubts, you know, religious doubt. Um, Nothing that is actually anyone, you know, surprise to anyone. I mean, we live in an Islamophobic age. All kinds of things create doubt. And I think that if anything, it's a more serious doubt than ever before because we're getting thrown um, a lot of information that is very specific about our faith, about our prophet, you know, peace be upon him, about Islam, um, a lot of, you know, contradictions and so forth. So I was sort of also interested to see, okay, well, what does Yakin Institute say about, um, you know, what are, and they say, what are the practical lessons that we can learn from this? Like, what are some of the solutions to this? Um, and so the solutions are that for parents, and again, remember that the research question is, can childhood experiences predict religiosity and doubt in adults? Which, I mean, I actually would argue is not really, it's an interesting question, but I don't think that that's a relevant question because whether or not you had good or bad childhood experiences, it doesn't change the, the reality that we live in today and how Islamophobia has changed in our time, you know, in our recent times, um, as opposed to, you know, what you might have been raised with 20, 30, you know, or fewer years ago. Um, so, but what do they say as practical lessons that, they can, that we can learn from all of this? For parents, you can set up your children for long-term religious contentment by modeling consistent religious values, providing a high quality religious education, avoiding harsh and overly strict attitudes and punishments, emphasizing the importance of faith in a warm and compassionate way, channeling their children into positive religious experiences, and encouraging strong friendships with other Muslim children. So it's, well, you know, a basic, I don't think there's anything that is surprising here. And then for adults who seek to decrease their own sense of doubt may find it helpful to, one, develop strong friendships with other Muslims, two, avoid actively anti-Islamic content online and elsewhere, three, dedicate themselves to daily prayer, four, prioritize internal reasons to have faith and avoid external pressures, five, find teachers who can adequately address lingering questions, and six, participate in positive religious experiences. Again, nothing really surprising here, but the thing that really jumps out to me is sort of the obvious point is that religion has to make sense. It has to address the issues that we face. 
we have to know what our Quran is, it means and says and how it's relevant to what the, the challenges that we face in our time. And so it's, it's just sort of highlighted again to me the specialness of what we do here because I feel like all of this stuff, you know, they probably spent a lot of time and effort to come to these very, very basic common sense conclusions. And, you know, it's fine, it's important to have evidence to back these kinds of things up. But what actually moves the meter and changes the reality and what actually addresses, you know, when Muslims decide they, they don't see anything interesting in Islam for them and they turn to either atheism or they move away from religion. You know, what we're talking about is what is it that actually will convince you that Islam has something to offer, that the Quran has actually something to say that is intelligent and relevant and, you know, and effective for your world. I mean, how, you know, so this is what is missing, I believe, um, that, and it's almost like it's even missing in the discussion. Like, all of this is premised on the idea that we understand, like, the Quran in a particular way, that there's no nuance, there's no place for sophistication, there's no way to sort of you know, really, that the, the, the Quran is all the same whether you get it from one source or another. And what we've learned here is obviously that that's not true. And, you know, um, so these kinds of things, you know, this is the best that, that our, you know, community has to offer right now. And to me, it feels like a bit of a kindergarten education because we need to dig a lot deeper and understand at a much deeper level what our book actually has to say. And it has to be something that is compelling, you know, in our day and age, for smart people, intelligent, thoughtful people, people who you know think of themselves as sophisticated, and th those are not the terms that I would necessarily use to you know address like how we as a as a community are approaching either our book or the problems that we face. And we talk about all this stuff here, but so you know to to address like okay, what so what is the solution? And I hope that people will just take, you know, an opportunity to share with others that, you know, look at the, the Project Illumina. I know it's hard to watch six hours or three hours or ten hours, however many hours we've spent on any particular surah. But hopefully as a Muslim, there's at least one surah that has piqued your interest, whether it's Surah Noor, Surah Baqarah, you know, whatever people love, you know, um, Yasin, whatever. Just pick any surah and just try to engage a little bit with you know one of these halakhas and then see what the difference is because part of our challenge is convincing people that the quran actually has something different to offer than what they hear at the mosque and what they you know what common knowledge might be um because i think what we hear what we cover here is absolutely stunning it's unprecedented it's obviously never been you know like this approach of even a thematic unity to a surah is something completely original and new to our tradition and this is the game changer so, you know, we're always, uh, I mean, I, for me, I'm always thinking about, okay, how do I convey to people that what we're doing is not what everybody else is doing? That this is not just a run of the mill tafsir that you can get no matter where you t tune in or wherever you go. It's not all the same. Um, so, you know, hopefully if, you, if people are on social media, they're following our Instagram posts, we're trying to, you know, drop really powerful quotes, um, excerpts from the khutbah and from the halakha, you know, all of these things hopefully are planting seeds for people for when they're actually ready to search. But, you know, this, these kinds of research models just sort of emphasize to me how far away we are from even like addressing, you know, okay, what is really going to prevent people from leaving this faith? It's that this religion has to offer something better, bigger, better, more reasonable, more rational, more interesting, more compelling, and, you know, relevant to what's going on. So for that, anyway, um, I am so excited to continue on our journey with Surah Al-Azab. I know last time we covered a lot of historical stuff, but, you know, we covered a lot of things about, for example, even the Prophet's wives that no one has ever heard before. We've never delved into anywhere else. So it's, I know what we do here is really special, and I'm so excited um, to continue, and I hope people will invite their friends to join us on this journey because it's it's such an incredible journey.